Thank you, Dr. Laurel. I still get embarrassed when people introduce me that way. 2,100 years, that's staying power. <clears throat> that really is staying power. There must be something very attractive about UTC to keep you here uh, as long as that. One thing I'd like to say, I was telling John before I uh, began looking at the back of the room, uh, one thing I do at the University of Nevada, Reno, is that I tell my students, those of you who sit in the front are going to get A's. <laughs> those of you who sit in the back are going to get F's. <laughs> it's a good way to get people to move up front. And yet, it's interesting, I'm sure, when you go into a classroom, you always feel kind of uncomfortable about the people who sit way up back. We really aren't going to do any harm to you, I don't think, if you sit up front. Uh, at any rate, uh, I'm very, very pleased to be here. It's a privilege to be here, especially having known the quality of people that you have as your colleagues. And uh, I would like to say that Bob Beebe, Jim Godfrey, um, John Udy, Fred, uh, Reed Parr, and Fred Rose, you can leave because you've already heard what I have to say. <laughs> but I hope you don't, uh, because I hope each time I have a chance to share time with folks like you that I also become renewed in spirit. And I think that's what the whole purpose of my being here today is, and that is to share with you some thoughts that will renew and refresh both of us, you and me. Um, Dr. Lowell mentioned self-concept development, and we're all in the self-concept business, every single one of us, because of the fact that we've taken on I think in this day and age, one of the most courageous responsibilities that we possibly could, and that is of teaching. Uh, no matter what it is you teach, no matter what it is you are an instructor of, you're taking a tremendous amount of courage to do that today, especially with the criticism that has been leveled on our profession in the last couple of years. Uh, those of us who stay in it uh, know that the criticism is unjustified, but whenever criticism comes about, it's a good time to have an opportunity to look at ourselves in turn and find out where we're at. So I thought today what I'd like to do with your indulgence is to take a journey into yourself. And in doing it, I'm taking a journey into myself. Every time I have the opportunity to share these thoughts, you're taking a journey into yourself and I am into myself. This is a wonderful time of the year to be talking about because most of you come back refreshed from uh, a summer experience. And even those of you who work 12 months a year have some kind of refreshment simply by seeing the new faces and knowing that it is a time of renewal. We have a tremendous uh, experience in our lives in the sense that we have two times a year of renewal. We think of spring as nature's renewal, and we think of fall as teacher's renewal. So we have the opportunity to become renewed ourselves. And the thoughts I share, I hope it will somehow be uh, at least one or two points in your mind when you're going into the classrooms next week. The journey into self. Uh, someone asked me earlier today, are you going to say anything different? Well, if you think about education and you've done anything with the history of the study of education, there isn't anything new or different in education. We just say it a little differently 100, 200 years later. And so I won't be sharing anything new, but I will be sharing a thought that I indicated to the gentleman who attended the meeting a couple of years ago that uh, um, I, I hope is a little bit new, but put perhaps in, in, different, uh, in different words. Several years ago, I had the opportunity to be president of the American Personnel and Guidance Association. And one of the things that I had had a criticism about uh, prior to that was that we heard people come out and give speeches. And the speeches always seemed canned, and, and we didn't seem to remember what it was they said. But because the president or the dean said we should be there, we, we had to be there and listen to them. And so I thought when I became president, I was going to develop a theme. And the theme would have to be something with which the counselors and the teachers and the instructors and university professors that I spoke with, a theme with which they could identify. Well, obviously, the theme that all of us 
identify with, although we don't have much time in today's world to do it, is ourselves. And so I developed the superstar self. And the superstar self goes back to people like John Dewey and, and Carl Rogers and Abraham Maslow. So I, it's not unique to me. I just put a package together. I, so I hope from a very feeling um, message to myself and to others too. Whenever I am not impressed or am not affected by sharing these thoughts, then I had better stop sharing them. You are the most important person in the world. And if you don't think that you're mo the most important person in the world, then maybe you better go back and take another good look in the mirror. Because if you're going into a classroom or you're going into an office and you're going to be dealing with young people, middle-aged people, old people, uh, I was talking to someone this morning about continuing, continuing education being a misnomer today because I think people at UTC know more than anybody that education is a lifelong experience. But it's a lifelong experience if we feel good about ourselves. If we feel good about ourselves, we never stop learning. We're continuing to do it all our lives from the day we're born until the day we die. But in order to appreciate the fact that we are the most important person in the world, and I say to you that it's wonderful to be able to talk with instructors and teachers, because if you don't believe that you are the most important person in the world, then you're going to be a hypocrite when you walk into that classroom next week. You've got to believe that about yourself. But the problem is, we don't have enough time to think about ourselves. And so what I'd like to do is simply take a few minutes to take you on a journey into yourself. Some of it you'll think is very important to you because it's something you haven't thought of in years. Other parts of it perhaps you think of every day. But if you can, picture a five-pointed star. Think about a five-pointed star. I call it the five pieces of the superstar self. And the superstar self is you, every one of you. And it's me, every single one of us in this room. And the five pieces of the superstar self, because I, I tend to deal in an acronyms and it's a good way to remember them, the first letter of the word pieces, the first letter P-I-E-C-E-S are the five points of the superstar self. And you're saying to me, hmm, P-I-E-C-E-S. She didn't go very far in school, did she? That's six letters. <laughs> but at any rate, the five pieces of the superstar self begin with the physical. Now, you've just come back from a summer holiday, and even those of you who have had 12 months uh, contract, I hope you had some time this summer to get away, because if you don't, burnout's going to catch up with you very quickly. Burnout's going to catch up with you anyway this year because you're an instructor, you're a teacher, you're in the field of education. You're the quickest burnout individuals that, uh, that ever lived on this earth. Why? Because you give so much to what you do and because you're not dealing with things, you're dealing with people. So what are you doing for your physical self? How long has it been since you've gone to a physician and said to him or her, how well am I? What percentage of people see a physician in this country when they are well? 4%. What percentage of us see a physician when we're ill? 96%. And you know, that doesn't make a lot of sense for intelligent people. How in the world is a physician ever going to be able to know when you're well if the only time he or she ever sees you is when you're ill? Think about that. We are, we, no wonder they control our lives so much. You know, because we, we just think it's, uh, it's, the, it's the bold truth when a physician tells us, well, this is what is wrong with you. But you know, it's a wonderful experience to go into a physician and say to him or her, uh, Dr. So-and-so, how well am I today? How well am I today? Try it. When I talk about the physical self, I share that the first thing we ought to do, and those of you who say to me, well, I really don't need to go to a physician. It's pouring good money after bad because I feel okay, I'm not ill. 
But I think the first thing we need to understand about ourselves and the first thing every single one of us needs to understand about ourselves, and I'm sure that those folks that you spoke of earlier, uh, Max, in terms of their illnesses, never thought of themselves, especially those who have had coronaries, never think of themselves as being ill. Coronary is a very dangerous criminal in this country because it affects us so quickly and so unexpectedly in so many of us. But if you know, if you can go into a physician and find out how well you are, then the next time you go and you're not feeling well, at least you have a baseline to go with. Now here's one of the ironies about wellness and holistic health. When you go into a physician, you must create an illness or insurance won't pay for your exam. Did you know that? You cannot collect insurance on a wellness exam. Now, I think we need to talk to our insurance companies <laughs> because obviously the best thing that we could possibly do is go in and find out how well we are. Wellness, ladies and gentlemen, is not an absence of illness. Don't say to me you're well because you're not ill. You're well because you have achieved a sense, a state of well-being in which every part of you feels good. Now, obviously, not all the time, because nobody's perfect. Nobody's physically perfect. Nobody's mentally perfect. This would be a terrible world if we all were, because there'd be no difference, no excitement, no change, if, if that were the case. So think, first of all, about your physical self. And I start with the physical self, because that's obviously the first thing that happens to us. Uh, when we uh, come into this world, the first thing the physician does, negatively again, is slap us you-know-where just to see if we're alive. And then we start kicking, because obviously we want to prove we are alive so that he doesn't hit us again. Think about that. It's kind of a negative way to hit, uh, the, to hit the world, and uh, in a lot of ways, I guess we have to hit it running. So then the next thing that happens is the intellectual. That's the second point of this, on the star. What did you do for your intellectual self this summer? How many of you, for example, have read uh, John Nesbitt's neg Megatrends? Um, that was almost a Freudian slip. Some of my colleagues think it's negatrends. Uh, <laughs> but at any rate, um, at least one person is thinking about our future and the futures of the people, future of the people who are coming after us. And in so many ways, the future is now. Those of you here at UTC, I would suspect, think of the future as now probably much more than our colleagues in the university setting. We think of the people in the university setting as living in ivory towers, and I guess I still feel that way. I had 20 years of uh, public elementary and secondary education before I joined the University of Nevada, Reno, and I guess I was sick of fighting them and decided the only way to live with them is to join them. And I'm sure you have those feelings about the, uh, the so-called Ivy Leagues uh, over there. And the Ivy League is not, not uh, um, a positive thing when you think of the ivy growing all over them. It takes a long time for ivy to grow. And uh, I look at some of my colleagues, and I think they'll be here forever watching that ivy grow. But what have you done? What have you learned this summer? What have you learned in the last five years? And again, I would suspect those of you at UTC are always learning. You always have to learn. You have to continue learning all your life. But what have you learned? Have you learned to ski lately? You know, have you learned? And I'm not talking about just the intellect, but you have to take the intellect to learn something. Whatever it is you want to learn, you have to take the intellect to do it. So if you're developing your physical self and you put the physical together with the intellectual, what are you combining? What are you learning? Or are you atrophying? I don't think anybody here is atrophying you know, where you're just kind of vegetating, waiting for retirement. I live with a lot of people in the University of Nevada, Reno, who are waiting for retirement. They, uh, they actually retired in 1955. They just haven't left the university yet. But I'm sure you know a lot of people like that. But the intellect must continue to grow. What kind of a journey have you taken into your intellect? What kind of a journey have you taken into your mind lately? Here's an opportunity to do it. You won't have much time now from September to June. And from June to September, you're probably just recovering from the last September to June. And so it's asking a lot of you to do that. But at any rate, every one of us should always be learning. 
every one of us should continue to learn all of our lives. Because if we, if we stop learning, of what value are we to the people who are learning from us? Are we still looking at notes that are dog-eared and yellow with age? You had those kind of professors in college, and I still see them. I'm not trying to tear down my colleagues at the university. They're not all like that. But if one is like that, what a terrible disadvantage he or she is to those students facing him or her in the classroom. But if you have a strong feeling about the importance of you, if you have a strong feeling about who you are, it conveys itself to your students. It spills over into your classroom. The old idea of the power of positive thinking, it is so easy in this day and age to think negatively. So easy for every one of us. If you think negatively, your students will think negatively. I used to think about this when I walked into elementary classrooms. I was a guidance supervisor several years ago. And I walk into elementary school classrooms and there's nothing, nothing more honest or more beautiful than children in the elementary schools. They haven't built the facades that we have around us. They haven't built the masks. And th so they're wide open and they'll tell you anything that, they, anything that they feel. But one of the disadvantages of elementary school children is that they take on the personality of their teachers. If you go into the classroom with a headache, by noontime every kid in your classroom has a headache. It's true, and it's true especially if your students here at UTC have a, have a strong feeling towards you. If they like you, and we don't go into teaching to be liked, but it helps. <laughs> it kind of helps if your students, you know, enjoy being with you. But I can guarantee whatever attitude you take into that classroom, I can guarantee that your students will have it uh, at least by noontime. The advantage, of course, teaching at a higher education level is that you only see them for about an hour or an hour and a half, or some of you with labs probably only see them for three or four hours a day. But you bring your personality into that classroom and your students pick it up. I can guarantee that they pick it up. And I was telling John when we were riding in today, this is one of, uh, simultaneously, teaching is one of the, one of the most rewarding and frustrating um, experiences, one of the most simultaneously rewarding and frustrating careers that we could possibly go into. Because we don't see, we don't see our product. We don't see what happens until five or six years down the line. You have a greater advantage over elementary, secondary, and professors at the university level because most of you are teaching skills that if they don't gain those skills, then they don't leave here. You're able to see at the end of a course how much did they learn, how much, how, how are they able to go out on a job. And then when they do go out on a job, in a lot of ways it's a disadvantage because if they don't do the job well, it does reflect on you. However, if they do do the job well, it also hopefully reflects on you. But we have a tendency in our, in our uh, mildly, I hope it's mildly, negative society to blame ourselves if we do well <laughs> or to give credit to ourselves if we do well. But if we do poorly, it's always somebody else's fault. And uh, it's my teacher, it's my parents, and so on and so forth. But the intellectual self is extremely important. What are you doing to renew yourself in that direction? And then we move down around the side to the right to the aesthetic, cultural, and spiritual. Here I bunch them all together. Because I teach at a public university, I can't call a point on the star spiritual. That's kind of too bad. But at any rate, we call it aesthetic and cultural. What have you done for your aesthetic self? How long has it been, and especially people who teach in a technological institute, especially for you. It's so easy to become tunnel visioned because the technology is, is rapid, so rapidly growing that you have so little time for yourself. But what have you done for your aesthetic self? And I don't want any hands. The back. How long has it been since you've been to a, an art museum? How long has it been since you've been to a, uh, an opera? And don't say to me, well, I'm not interested in anything like that, because after all, um, it's back on again. <laughs> uh, how long has it been since you've seen a good play? I don't have time. 
T-I-M-E. By the way, that's the worst weapon, the most criminal weapon in our society today. The lack of time. We have time, ladies and gentlemen, to do anything that's important to us. We have time to do anything that we want to spend the time doing. But how many times have you said in the last six months or a year, I just don't have the time? What we're really saying is, I don't want to take the time. I don't want to take the time to do those kinds of things. Remember, we only go this way once. We only go in this direction once. Don't you want to crowd as much, as much experience into it as you possibly can? It's funny, so many of us think about that too late. When we're too old or too decrepit or, or too uh, infirm to be able to enjoy it. And yet the wisdom of our older folks is enjoy it now. Go out and do the kinds of things that you've always wanted to do. Don't wait till retirement to do it. How many of you did the things this summer that you said you wanted to do last spring? Great. Some of you did. How about getting to your colleagues and telling them how you did it? Or did the summer go by and you always kept meaning to do it and meaning to do it and now it's going to be, well, next summer I'll do it, next summer I'll get around to it. Aesthetic and cultural and the spiritual. What about the spiritual self? In a lot of ways I envy um, your own state in general. It was kind of interesting watching your uh, new Miss America on television this morning. And uh, I, th I thought how wonderful the people in the state of Utah must feel and how proud you must be of that young woman. Uh, someone glibly asked her, and I'm sure I would have felt uncomfortable as, as she did too, uh, her response. Somebody said to her, you're almost too good to be true. Uh, why? And so she responded in a uh, very wise uh, way for a 20-year-old. She said, well, she said, I don't understand what you're saying. She said, uh, after all, she said, just because I don't drink and I don't smoke, she said, is that, why, is that why I'm too good to be true? And she said, well, she said, I have an advantage over a lot of people. She said, I have the privilege of having been brought up a Mormon. And she said, in our religion, she said, in our faith, she said, we feel very, very strongly about ourselves. We pride ourselves. We pride our family. And she said, I can't understand that being too good to be true. But she said, if it's too good to be true, then that's my answer. So you do have an advantage, the, the high percentage of people who do um, follow the Mormon religion in this state. So it's easy to speak about the spiritual self. But for those of you who do not, you still have a spiritual self. Now, I have to be very careful again at the University of Nevada, Reno, when I'm talking about the spiritual self because they think I'm going to be fired for teaching religion. And that's not it at all. Every one of us has a spiritual self. Every single one of us. You might call it, if you're not of a religious persuasion, you might call it peace of mind. If you are of a religious persuasion, you tend to call it peace of soul. But where do you go and how do you get at peace with yourself? And if I were to say to you right now, on a scale of one to ten, with one being no peace at all, and with ten being the highest peace possible, where are you? at peace with yourself. I would think, all things being equal, that today should be the most peaceful time in your life, professionally, personally. Today should be. It may not be. But if it isn't, why? <coughs> if it isn't the most peaceful day, or if yesterday wasn't the most peaceful day, or if tomorrow isn't the most peaceful day. What I'm talking about is your spirit. One of the things I ask my students at the university is, where is the center of your own spirit? Where in your body is the center of your own spirit? Immediately somebody will say, well, it's in my heart. Or it's in my elbow. I've had some students say to me, it's in my elbow. Those people really uh, impress me. And I ask them why. And a lot of people will say, 
It's where I feel the most of me. Some say in my eyes. Some say in the back of my head. I remember growing up, we always believed my mother had eyes in the back of her head, and I'm sure you did too, because she always saw the things we did wrong. But again, you know, she never saw the things we did right. <laughs> it was always the things we did wrong. Not always, hopefully. Mothers aren't like that. But, oh, some of you do have mothers like that. <laughs> I picked up that snicker. But at any rate, where is your spiritual self? We look to our spirit. We look to our spirit to find renewal for tomorrow. I know a lot of us, I'm sure those of us in the teaching profession, say to ourselves at the end of a day, I hope I haven't done anybody harm. I hope maybe I've done some good, but if I haven't done any good, I hope I haven't done any harm. And that's the idea of the spiritual self. Every one of us has a spiritual self. Even atheists have spiritual selves. I have some atheist acquaintances that I love to get into dialogue with. And I ask them, you know, why do you behave in society if you're an atheist? And they always give me the line, well, I believe in the inevitable and, and uh, ultimate good of man in the generic sense. And I said, well, how can you believe in the ultimate good of man? Where did your good come from? You know the old saying that there are no atheists in foxholes. And I'm sure that some of you men who have served in, in wartime and Hopefully we'll never ever have that experience again, but those of you who have served in wartime know exactly what I mean. That there are no atheists in foxholes. That ultimately everyone has to reach to, to something. And I'm sure there are no atheists at UTC, but if, if you are, I'd love to get into dialogue with you sometime. At any rate, our spiritual selves. Our spiritual selves are what give us the renewal to continue on. As Max indicated to you earlier, some of you have had some unpleasant experiences this summer. Some of us still look forward to those experiences with our parents and our loved ones who are going to pass away. And then, of course, ultimately it will happen to us. But in looking at our parents and looking at those who have passed away, those of us who have a deep spiritual belief have a feeling that they're passing away into another experience, perhaps, hopefully, a better experience. And it will happen to all of us. But what kind of strength did you have when that happened? What kind of strength will we have when the closest of our loved ones, loved ones leaves us? And some of us have had that experience where the closest of our loved ones has left us. But somehow we gain the strength Somehow we gain the spiritual strength to continue on. So again, what do you do for your spiritual self? Where do you go to smell the roses along the way? And I don't mean driving along the highway watching the sunrise or watching it suns the sunset. You're supposed to be paying attention to your driving then. But, you know, where do you take 15, 20 minutes every single day just to focus in on yourself, on your spirit, on where you are, and I don't mean from a hedonistic point of view, obviously you can tell I don't mean from a hedonistic point of view, but if you don't believe that you're a superstar, who's going to do it? Which leads me to the next point, and that's the emotional point on the star. The emotional self. What are you doing for your emotional self? Where do you go to cry? Where do you go to cry? And who do you cry with? Several years ago, I was consulting with the American Iron and Steel Institute. And um, I don't know how many of you, I know some of you know of the American Iron and Steel Institute, especially those of you who work in, in the metals field. The American Iron and Steel Institute is 100% male, and uh, they have an average income of about $120,000 apiece. They have an average age of about 50. And 99% uh, of them are married to women who have never worked outside the home. And I don't know why they asked me to consult with them, but they did. And I worked with them for about six years. And one of the things I did in working with them, and those of you who are in and have come from the field of business and industry know better, perhaps, than those of you who have always been in education what I'm saying. People who work where the profit motive 
uh, is the ultimate goal in their lives, live under a great deal of stress, a great deal of stress, and so they have to have a lot of uh, impact on stress power in which they have stress work for them instead of against them. Well, when we got to the emotional point on the star, looking out and, lo and looking over an audience of, you know, a hundred men, we, we started with a hundred and then we broke down into smaller groups, but looking over a hundred men at that age, having had that kind of success in life, all of them wearing navy blue or gray pinstripe three-piece suits with white handkerchiefs and dark ties, you know, it was almost like looking out at a um, private boys' school. And that's what I created in my mind, a private boys' school, because that was the only way I could communicate with them. But one of the reasons why I said to them, I said, you have to learn to cry. And for a lot of the gentlemen in this audience, it's probably the first time you've heard it. But the Menninger brothers, this isn't Maple saying it, the Menninger brothers who together have put not 2,100 years president, but 40 years of peace, 80 years together they have put into the study of mental health. And they have said after their 80 years of study together that our physical, our mental, and our emotional selves must be always in tune with each other before we can find peace and before we can find physical health. So one of the things I had to do was get these men to cry. And I thought that's going to be, and it was, the biggest challenge of my life. So I sent to the um, American Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences and asked them to send me the two saddest movies that had ever been produced. And a week went by. Fortunately, I did work with this particular group for a six-month period of time. A week went by, and I didn't hear from them. And another week went by, and I didn't hear from them. And the third week went by, and I thought, maybe that was a strange request to make. So I called Hollywood, California, and I spoke to the president of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences at the time, and I told him who I was and was wondering what had happened. He said, Dr. Maples, he said, you don't know what a furor you have sent my board into. And I said, what? <laughs> and he said, do you realize we've been arguing for three weeks what the two saddest movies have ever been produced and we can't come up with a decision? Well, one of the things when I tell that story I don't tell is at that time the American Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences was made up of 12 men. There were no women in that group. So when I ask people to guess what they finally sent me, and they did about a week later send me the two movies, a lot of people can't understand why they selected those movies. But after just seeing one of them a couple of weeks ago, I can well understand why those men selected these two movies. And they did the trick. Anybody want to guess what the movies were? Close. Close. Lassie, come home was close. Where the Red Fern Grows was one of them. And every time I say Where the Red Fern Grows, I get goosebumps. But Where the Red Fern Grows was on a couple of weeks ago, and I was looking at it again from the point of view of why those men cried, and they did. If you haven't seen it, it's about a, a boy who grows up with two dogs and the, and the struggle he goes through to get them and so on and so forth and, and what happens when they die. So that was one of them. Anybody want to guess what the other one was? It was a musical. Probably you'd have some difficulty guessing that one. The Man from La Mancha. And you can understand if you've seen it, and that's, of course, the story of Don Quixote. And I could understand why very successful men would select uh, Man from La Mancha as their saddest movie. And it did the trick. These men were able to cry, and it was really fascinating to, to see their response afterwards. We had to take a whole day to program their experience with crying. Some of them obviously were extremely embarrassed because it had been the first time that they had ever remembered in their lives crying. Because in the society that we grow up in, we socialize our men not to cry. And as a result, those of us who are female live longer than they do because we can cry every time we get a chance. <laughs> Except that some of us don't. Some of us are brought up in the kind of society where girls don't cry either. But in doing that, 
we're not able to release the emotions that come out as a result of crying. The Menninger brothers are very f famous for saying, they have a famous saying, that in order to be physically, mentally, and emotionally healthy, we have to have a good old-fashioned belly laugh at least once a month. And interestingly enough, it's my ladies who always say, oh, a belly laugh, oh, belly laugh. How crude! <laughs> and there is nothing that feels better than a belly laugh unless it's what the Menninger brothers say three or four times a year and that's a good old-fashioned cry. And a good old-fashioned cry does the same thing that a good old-fashioned belly laugh does. Now, if you laugh hard enough that you cry, you get two for the price of one. <laughs> And it is fascinating to watch people have that experience. And those men, it was, it was phenomenal. They had, they had to be deprogrammed from the weakness aspect, that when we cry, we are weak, but we've been socialized. We are the only Western civilization that actually believes that. I hope I'm not insulting anybody, but have you ever seen a group of Italian men together? Boy, there are emotions going on, not only with their mouths and their eyes, but their hands, too. They're going a mile a minute, and they're healthy, and usually, especially if they live in, in Italy, and I can't understand why, uh, they're very happy, too. But at any rate, we must learn. We must learn to let go. We've got to learn to let go. If we can't learn to let go, then we're going to be victims of coronaries. The research is replete with the idea that unless we can be at peace with ourselves and then let our emotions out and let ourselves free, then we're going to find that we're going to have a difficult time in making it through life and certainly living to be uh, long, long-lived. But those who are long-lived have had a lot of emotional experiences in their lives. So the question there is, where do you go to cry? And are you ashamed of crying? Hopefully you shouldn't be ashamed of crying. Even Christ himself, if we look back 2,000 years ago, cried. He cried when he went into the temple and saw all the people in the temple just denigrating all of the things that he had, he had wanted the temple to be. So in so many ways, he cried in the garden. So why can't we, in one way or another, follow that example? We, follow, we try to follow his example in many ways, but in that particular aspect, uh, we're a little bit hesitant to do it. But we'll be healthier if we do. And then the idea being that if you can't go somewhere to cry, I wonder about your support system. Where do you go to really let loose? Where do you go? Do you go home to your spouse, to your partner? To your friends, are you able to let loose on that with them? And if you are, you're a very fortunate person. That leads, leads us to the last point on the star, and that's the social point. How long has it been since you've made a new friend? How long? If I said to you, any of you, uh, you have 24 hours to go out and make a new friend. 24 hours to make a new friend. How many of you could honestly do that? And don't give me the cop out. Oh, oh, 24 hours to make a new friend? It takes me a much longer period of time. I only have about five good friends and it's taken me 20 years to get them. You had to start somewhere. You know, if it took 20 years to have them be your friends, you had to start somewhere. And I always say this, and if, if we were closer together, I'd go up and, and demonstrate it. But if I came up to you in Reno, especially if you were a gentleman, if I came up to you on the street in Reno and said to you, hmm, Max, you look like an awfully nice person. I'd like to get to know you. What would you think? <laughs> That's the biggest laugh I've had out of you yet. Every single one of you knows what he would think. And I suspect it might happen right here in your own town. But at any rate, look at little first graders. Look at little first graders, six years old. They can go up. I can remember having an experience that was really fun. Went into a first grade about a year ago. A little kid came up to me and looked at me and said, Hey, you bleach your hair. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, isn't that wonderful to have the freedom to be able to say something to someone 
and not have them get angry. And yet, if an adult said it, the facades that we build around ourselves don't allow that to happen. How long has it been? And here's a wonderful experience, as President Carnahan said to you earlier, 22 new faculty. Here's a wonderful opportunity for 22 new faculty to go up to someone right here, because you wouldn't think that here, you know, to go up to someone right here and say, hey, I like your face. I'd like to get to know you. Try it. I'll bet you you won't be able to do it. <laughs> Some of you will. Some of you will, because you have that freedom. You have that social presence to be able to do it. And I suppose the reason why I'm so strong on it is because I wouldn't be able to do it either. If I said, you've got 24 hours to make a new friend, if you don't, you're going to be dead in 24 hours. Wow. How am I going to do that? We'd all be clamoring to run out in the streets of Salt Lake City and go make new friends, and the police would be coming right behind us, right down the street. And isn't that a shame? Isn't that a shame? You have a wonderful opportunity now to make new friends. Now, if you haven't made any new friends in 20 years, you're still with the same friends that you were with 20 years ago, my goodness, look at, look at what you're missing in life. Look at what you're missing. Here's a whole brand new group of people. And those of you who have shared the 2,100 years, I'll bet there are a lot of people here you don't know. I'll bet there are a lot of people you don't know here. Go up and introduce yourselves. Here when we take the break at 10 o'clock, here's a first opportunity to do so. And I'm going to be watching you, every one of you. I'm going to give you the marks. And maybe some of you down the back getting the Fs will get an A on that. At any rate, here is a wonderful opportunity. And again, it's been a very, very brief journey into yourself. But I need to say again, because I need to be reinforced, I'm the most important person in, in my world. And because I'm the most important person, the other persons in my world can be important too. If you're the most important person, if you feel that you're the most important person in your world, I can guarantee you're going to go home tonight and look at those other important people and find out how important they are. Where did the saying come from? Have you hugged your child today? The bumper sticker? Mm -hmm. How long has it been since you've hugged the most important person in your life? How long has it been since you've looked at the most important person in your life and said, hey, I really love you? How long has it been since the most important person in your life has said, I love you, for no reason at all? Why is it so difficult for us to say that? The most important three words in our entire vocabulary. <coughs> 2,000 years ago, in the first century, Rabbi Hillel said it much better than I could. If I am not for myself, who will be for me? If I am only for myself, what do I matter? And if not now, when? Thank you very much for listening.